I want to go back to this really high gold demand and also demand for physical silver that we've been seeing over the last little while. You spoke about how the mints are seeing such such huge demand from investors. Can you go into a little bit more detail on what that actually means? Because we've started to hear things about mints, you know, perhaps not being able to meet that demand. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean when all of this is happening? Is it a supply chain issue? Is it simply that the right size or type of the metal is not available? What does it actually mean? Mm -hmm. Very good question, uh, Charlotte. And uh, for uh, some of your viewers who may not be familiar, uh, government mints uh, are mints because uh, we have the ability by our constitutions to actually make money. And so our value added is taking a piece of paper or a piece of metal and at the end of our manufacturing process, it becomes uh, legal tender. And so uh, mints uh, end up making uh, bullion coins uh, and they're called coins because uh, a mint, a government mint makes them and it has to denominate them. Uh, so our one ounce coin, uh, a gold, uh, our one ounce gold eagle has $1,788 worth of gold in it today, uh, but it has a denomination of $50. And what that means uh, is that uh, you can spend it for $50, even though it has all that precious metal in it. And we denominate it lower than what its uh, metal value is because we want to force the owner and the receiver to be able to uh, value it for its precious metal. And you can't denominate it uh, to its precious metal content because of the fluctuating prices. So saying that, um, there are shortages in all the major mints right now due to high demand for these uh, denominated uh, bullion coins, both gold and silver. And uh, part of that is just due to, uh, you know, the shortages are due to the high demand. Uh, and, but the other part is due to supply chain challenges. So um, uh, I can't, when, when uh, uh, gold demand really went up under my tenure, I can't go to the uh, local convenience store and buy gold planchets to stamp my uh, coins on. It's a very specialized field with a very limited capacity. And so these, uh, uh, like the United States Mint, we buy from private companies who specialize in this. And uh, in order for them to meet that increased demand, they have to hire more people, they have to spend uh, more CapEx to expand their plant and uh, to buy the equipment, et cetera. And so there's a lag time that's needed in order to increase their supply. But COVID also has exacerbated these supply chain challenges because uh, all the way up from the mining to the refining, to the making of planchets, to the uh, companies that deliver the planchets to us. Uh, you know, if you have someone sick um, or you have fewer employees, it starts uh, disrupting uh, the supply chain. And also at the United States Mint, even though I'm no longer the Mint Director, uh, there's been several incidents of COVID where we've had to shut down uh, our manufacturing plants. And then it takes a while to uh, warm the equipment up again and, and so on. And so though uh, COVID has uh, disrupted uh, the normal, very fragile supply chain uh, that supplies uh, the, the global mints. Uh, second is, uh, you know, when we get the gold, we in the United States, we have a special challenge and that's the legislation that authorized us to make gold bullion requires us to get uh, gold uh, from uh, or to have gold that's been actually mined and produced here in the United States. And so uh, uh, that adds an additional challenge uh, to what we have. Uh, the last thing that I want to say uh, about uh, demand and supply is that for mints, it's more cost efficient for us to produce one ounce coins than it is to produce 10 one-tenth of an ounce uh, coins. Uh, and so when push comes to shove, uh, uh, mints end up deferring to doing the cost, most cost efficient way of uh, producing gold bullion or silver bullion. And so they produce it in, in one ounce amounts. Uh, and that's, uh, that's causing an issue because whenever the mints are able to make smaller denominations, uh, 
the mints are finding that there is growing market demand as gold prices go higher. So for example, the, the common person on the street and probably you and I, Charlotte, uh, we don't carry $2,000 in our pocket readily to buy a one ounce gold coin. It's something we have to plan for and save for. But it's a lot easier for us to buy a one tenth of an ounce one at $200. And so what we're finding out that as gold prices rise, there's a greater demand for bullion in ever smaller amounts. And there are private sector makers like the company that I work with uh, that are filling that niche uh, for smaller amounts. So you are at Valorum, you're seeing this demand for the smaller amounts of gold. Can you go into that in a little bit more detail so we can get a sense of, of the demand? Yeah, so um, you know we have the same issue as all the other mints do, and that is we have a backlog of orders uh, that we have to fill. And so demand far outstrips the supply that we're able to uh, put to the market. And you know, just to give you a perspective, uh, when I was at the Mint, uh, this is what we made. This is the global standard, even more than the Cougarand, uh, for one ounce gold coins. And this is the American Eagle gold one ounce coin. Um, and as, as you see, you know, uh, uh, when you have something like this, you have to have $2,2100 to buy it on a retail basis today. Uh, but what Valorum has been able to do is uh, with technology, uh, we're able to break down gold into its atomic state and then reapply that gold onto any surface we want at a very precise layer. And so the problem is uh, when you try to make smaller amounts of gold and the smallest one the US Mint made was one tenth uh, of an ounce, uh, you end up having a coin about the size of a penny. Uh, and if you make it any smaller than that, you can easily lose it. Uh, it's very hard to make with all the features that are on a coin. But if you take a look at this, uh, this is a Valorum note that has a one tenth of a gram of gold in it. All the gold color you see there is 100% solid gold at 24 karat purity. And a one tenth of a gram would be the equivalent of about a grain of sand. And so when you spread it out this thin, it is about one quarter the width of a human hair uh, being applied here, but we're able to do it in a very verifiable uh, form so that if this, if you uh, melted the two pieces of polymer uh, sandwiching this, uh, you would get exactly one tenth of a gram, which is about $6 of the gold. Now, all of a sudden gold becomes much more affordable to a greater number of people. And that's what's driving our demand. That's really interesting. And I appreciate the examples that you had to show. So we've been talking a lot about gold, which is always great. I do want to throw in a question on silver, where we're also seeing quite an interesting situation develop over the last few months. We've seen retail investors really snapping up physical silver, trying to create this silver squeeze and push the price up. Mm -hmm. I've heard a lot of different perspectives about whether it's actually possible to squeeze the silver price in that way by, by buying up physical metal. So I wanted to get your perspective on, on what's going on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very relevant question, uh, given uh, what recently happened uh, with the whole GameStop situation and Robinhood. When you look at that, uh, uh, GameStop, uh, they were able to put the squeeze on that and really shook up the market a bit. Uh, and uh, GameStop's not a small company. It has a market cap of $12 billion. And then soon after that, um, these uh, individual investors were looking for other uh, targets that they thought uh, uh, they could put the squeeze on and silver became one of their targets. But uh, one of the things that happened was uh, that plan was dropped uh, pretty quickly. That was really a couple days story and it was all over and uh, people got out of it. And here's the reason why. Uh, the total silver market cap, and I'm talking about all the silver that's ever been mined in the world versus all the game stock, uh, a GameStop stock added up together, which would be 12 billion. All the silver that's ever been mined in the world at today's prices would be $1.4 trillion. So that's 120 times um, a, a, a volume of uh, what the GameStop market cap is. And it's a lot harder 
for a group of individual investors to capture the market and put the squeeze on silver. Uh, plus, you have uh, much more diverse use uh, for silver. So not all that silver is used for uh, investment purposes. Uh, so it's not as uh, a consolidated place to get it all as, uh, as the stock market is for an individual stock. Uh, you have industrial use, jewelry, uh, electronics, uh, uh, derivatives, uh, and people who, who, when I was at the Mint, when people bought one ounce of silver, our American Eagle silver, uh, you know, they would do the modern term for uh, Bitcoin as HODL, uh, which is hold on for dear life. When people uh, generally buy a silver bullion, they hold on to it. And so there was just a lot less available, uh, really only the, the derivatives that were available to uh, these investors to try to corner the market. And that has such a, a small percentage of the overall uh, market cap of silver. Um, in, in retrospect, people looking at this uh, could have figured out that they would have very little impact. All right, well, thank you for that explanation. We've got so much going on in gold and silver. We've covered just a few of the things that are happening. One other point that's going on right now is amid all of this activity, there's a number of American states that are looking at introducing legislation related to recognizing gold and silver as legal tender. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if you could help us put that into context as well by explaining how are they seen now and what is this legislation looking to change? So in my world, uh, which is money and gold, uh, this is a really a big deal and it's getting uh, not a lot of play outside of certain policy circles and what's going on in these states. Uh, so I'm really glad, Charlotte, that you brought this up because I think a lot more attention needs to be placed on it. So saying that, uh, this gets right back to the Constitution. Uh, so when the Constitution was written, uh, money was the equivalent of precious metal uh, so it didn't matter if you had one ounce of silver that was made from Spain or from France or from England. Uh, uh, one ounce of silver was, uh, was one ounce of silver anywhere. And if you wanted a half a dollar or, or you know, half that amount, you'd cut that coin in half or quarters, uh, which is how we get the fractional system uh, that uh, we refer to coins now uh, uh, these days. And what the Constitution ended up doing was the recognition by our founders that our uh, country needed to be unified by a federal government. And that federal government uh, had to have the authority uh, to have control over our currency. And so they took that away from the states and consolidated it within the federal government. And that's how the mint was created, well, was from the constitution. Uh, but what they left to the states to decide is whether or not to allow their citizens to settle their debts in gold and silver. Uh, you can find this in Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution. So um, uh, no state has ever exercised this uh, since it was put in the Constitution until after the financial crisis. So I don't think it was a coincidence that states started considering this after 2008. And currently, there are 12 states that have implemented some form of state legislation that operationalizes Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution. Uh, I'm not sure I can uh, get all 12 out of memory, but uh, West Virginia, Utah, um, Arizona, uh, Oklahoma, uh, Texas, uh, Indiana, uh, Louisiana, Tennessee, uh, South Carolina, and I know there's a couple more in there. And what legislation, uh, what's in the legislation that these states are passing in order to operationalize as part of the constitution? Uh, there are really um, four parts, uh, four different legislative aspects that have been implemented to some degree uh, in all of these 12 states. One is uh, that the state itself recognizes gold and silver as legal tender, meaning uh, that people, uh, as long as uh, someone's willing to buy with it and someone willing to accept it, 
um, it is uh, legal in order to have that exchange. So if two people voluntarily want to uh, transact in gold and silver, uh, that is a legal transaction. And so most of the legislation includes that piece. But there are uh, uh, two other common pieces that are uh, associated with this. One is a sales tax exemption. So uh, when you buy gold or silver now, uh, states usually uh, consider that buying a product and as a result, assess some type of sales tax on it. But when you end up uh, you know, traveling Europe and exchanging dollars for euros, uh, you're not being charged a sales tax uh, for, for doing that. You may be charged a, an exchange fee, but uh, there are no taxes because uh, it's commonly considered money for money uh, is not buying a product. Uh, and so uh, these states have, uh, some of them have exempted gold and silver sales from state uh, sales tax. Uh, the other part of the taxation uh, piece that's normally included in this is uh, whether or not capital gains can be assessed at the time that you use gold. So say, for example, you buy gold for $1,000 and it's worth $2,000 today and uh, you spend uh, $20 of it to buy something. Uh, you know, uh, do you pay ten dollars? Uh, uh, do does ten dollars of that twenty dollar purchase subject to a capital gains tax? And what these states are saying is, no, it shouldn't. Uh, just as the dollar rises or uh, or uh, devalues, uh, you don't pay uh, capital gains or take capital losses. And every time your dollar fluctuates, you shouldn't uh, be subject to the same uh, when you're uh, buying and selling in gold. And then uh, uh, those are the two common pieces. And then there's one uncommon piece that's really interesting to me. And that is in Texas, in addition to these uh, precious metal legal tender laws uh, that have been passed, Texas has created its own state-owned bullion depository. It's called the Texas Bullion Depository. And their purpose is to develop something to the effect of a state-level Fort Knox. So when I was Mint Director, Fort Knox came under my uh, jurisdiction uh, for, uh, for oversight. And uh, that's where uh, at least half of our nation's gold reserves continue to remain in Fort Knox. And uh, the Texas Bullion Depository was created by Texas, not only so that uh, Texans can keep their gold in state instead of in a depository in Delaware or New York City, so it's closer to them, but also uh, Texas wanted the option of, uh, as they operationalize Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution, uh, they wanted the option of having their own depository where Texans can uh, deposit their monetary gold. And, uh, and uh, Texas is currently exploring uh, how they can use that uh, depository in a way to provide a payment mechanism that's a lot easier than some of the other ones that these other states are using.